Uh, we've looked at a lot of, uh, of uh, legends, we've got a lot of people in, in Scripture, and we've talked about uh, many, many different ones, and uh, this week we're going to look at Jonathan. When we began uh, discussing uh, people in the Scriptures who've had an impact on our lives and that the Lord has used to teach us many lessons, I don't think anybody mentioned Jonathan. But as soon as you saw the name Jonathan, what did you think? You thought David, but you thought, oh yeah, that's a good one. That's one that often goes unmentioned, uh, but uh, there's some great lessons that we're going to learn from the life of Jonathan. Of course, we've been over many legends. This is the 13th one. I don't know how many people end on number 13, but that's what we're going to end on, number 13. I was reminded recently by uh, a uh, wonderful church member that one time I preached a message that had 19 points in it, so why not, uh, why not 13? It's just a number, right? Um, but um, how many of you, there is... Uh, uh, someone in the scripture that we have not looked at yet that uh, has had an impact when you read or that you can really relate to uh, when we talk about these lessons from legends. Anybody can mention any that we have not talked about? Anybody? Nobody? Everybody's like, oh, I've got somebody. I can't remember if we talked about them or not. How many of you are in those shoes, right? Tom? Jonah. Jonah, there's a great one. How many of you can find some commonalities in your life with Jonah? I know that I can often find myself in a circumstance or a situation, and I think I can get my way out of it. And God says, you're going to have to repent and pray your way out of this one. And how many of you have been there before? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. Oh, there's some real spiritual people who've never been there before. I'm proud of you. Anybody else? Jonah, that's a great one. Anybody else? Good, Jonas. That's the only one we haven't covered. Wonderful. Good, good, good. All right. We're going to look uh, we're going to look at Jonathan. When you think of Jonathan, what do you immediately think of? Friendship. Friendship. What a real friend is. How many of you would say you have some real friends in your life? Somebody you can count on, depend on. That's wonderful to have friends in your life. Somebody, and you've probably heard this before. They said if you could if if it took you more than just one hand to count your number of true friends, you'd be blessed. That's probably true. We have a lot of acquaintances, people that we're close to, but real genuine friends are probably very limited uh, in number, but Jonathan's known for being uh, a friend. And he was a friend to who? He was a friend to David. First Samuel 18, verse number 1 says, And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day, would let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David in his garments, even to his sword, to his bow, and to his girdle. The Bible talks quite a bit about friendship. When I think of some of the most famous songs, we think of what a friend we have in Jesus. How about no one ever cared for me like Jesus? Undoubtedly, we know that he's the ultimate example of a friend. The Bible says, No greater love hath any man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend. And when we look at the example of a friend, we could certainly look at Jesus Christ and the friendship that the Bible talks about we have with him, but there's something about connecting with an individual like, David, like Jonathan to help us understand some of the great attributes that make up a good friend. I wonder sometimes if people aren't better friends to me than I am a friend to them. You ever feel that way? Sometimes we can easily feel that we fall short, and yet we see the, the kindness and the love that others express to us. When we look at this, we see that he had, first of all, he had a strengthening friendship. You know, in the world today, most people simply view friendship as a relationship. They would almost equate those two words. And most often, they see a friend that exists out of a relationship that has something that can benefit them. You know, Jonathan's life is really typified, it was characterized by a relationship which really put him at great danger. 
There wasn't something that he could gain from it, but the truth is there was something that he could lose from it. Actually, we see a, a great model of the friendship of Christ and what he did for us. We understand this, friends strengthen each other. When one is weak, the other needs somebody to hold him up. I think of Aaron and her, who stood and held up the hands of Moses when he was weak. And that which he could not do on his own, he had friends who came alongside him and helped him be able to accomplish, have success. You know, friends should be there to strengthen one another. I'm thankful that God has given me people in my life that when I am weak, that they are strong and that they can hold up my hands. Uh, There's simply just a handful or less of people that if I'm hurting, I can call and say, hey, I'm struggling. I'm hurting. I'm discouraged. I'm down. Those people will help strengthen me. They'll encourage me through the Word of God. Uh, To have a friend is to have someone who can help strengthen us. Proverbs chapter 17 and verse number 17 says, A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. If you've had many friends, we understand the reality of Proverbs 17, 17, when it says a friend loveth what? At all times. If you have a true friendship, you'll find that in any relationship, there's going to be good times in a friendship, and there's going to be what? There's going to be tough times in a relationship and in a friendship. But Solomon says it well when he says a friend loveth at all times. There's a, uh, a portion of a letter that was written This is from John Wesley to William Wilberforce. This was dated February 26th, 1791. For years, William Wilberforce, I don't know why that's so hard for me to say, Wilberforce, had pushed in Britain's parliament for the abolition of slavery. Discouraged, he was about to give up. He had a friend. His friend most of us have heard of. His name is John Wesley. He heard of it, and he wrote a a short note of encouragement. You know, we never know what a quick note. We say a note. Nobody writes notes anymore. A quick text message (laughs) or a phone call to encourage somebody can really mean. Here's Here's what John Wesley said. He said, unless the divine power has raised you up, I see not how you can go through your glorious enterprise in opposing that villainy, which is the scandal of religion of England and of human nature. Unless God has raised you up for this very thing, you will be borne out by the opposition of men and devils. But if God be for you, who can be against you? Are all of them together stronger than God? Oh, be not weary in well-doing. Go on in the name of God and in the power of his might, till even American slavery, the vilest that ever saw the sun, shall vanish away before it. A few days after writing this, John Wesley died. The final abolition of slavery in Britain was more than 40 years later. One of the greatest voices for such was this man, William Wilberforce, who almost gave up, stopped fighting, but somebody lifted him up. A friend encouraged him. Anybody ever need encouragement? Anybody? You think if you need encouragement that other people need encouragement? Sometimes when someone is down, we're quick to judge them. We're quick to wonder what's going on. Maybe they don't seem themselves. Maybe they're struggling. Instead of criticizing, why don't we help? When we can tell that they're hurting, instead of pushing away, why don't we draw closer? The natural reaction of many people when they're struggling is to do what? Draw away from people. But what they need most at that time is real friends who push through all of that. 
to love at all times, as the Scripture says. The sequoia trees, the great redwoods of California, some of them rise as much as 300 feet above the surface of the earth. How many of you have seen the sequoias in the, in the redwoods of, of California? They say that this is true. They say you seldom see a sequoia or a redwood that is standing by itself. You know why? Its roots do not go very deep. Actually, their, their roots go outward in a pattern to draw as much moisture from the, from the surface of the ground as is possible. So standing by themselves, their roots are not very strong. But they grow next to others of the same kind, and their roots grow out, and they intertwine one with another. And in doing so, they have strength that they could not have on their own. As Christians, are we not the same? As friends, should we not be that same strength and encouragement to somebody else who needs it? They say that if a, one of these mighty trees in California were to stand alone, that a strong wind could easily blow it over. It reminds us of the strength that there is in the church, in a group of people, in friendships, we consider the sequoias, or we consider the uh, we consider uh, uh, John Wesley and his encouragement to to his friend. Maybe you thought of somebody who's encouraged you, a source from which you gain strength. That's what Jonathan was for David. He was a strengthening friend. Are are you a friend that's quick to judge someone? When they're struggling, or are you one that's quick to come alongside of them and strengthen them and encourage them and help them? And we find out that Jonathan, he sought David physically to be close to him. In 1 Samuel uh, chapter number 23 and verse number 16, And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David into the wood and strengthened his hand in God. You know, Jonathan went to David to be a friend to him, to help him. When David was in hiding because of the relentless pursuit of King Saul that sought to kill him, there was one who was willing to put himself in danger alongside of his friend, and that was Jonathan. You know, we're all busy. How many of you have more to do than you can get done. Probably everybody would raise their hand. Is there anything greater we could spend our time, though, than to encourage a friend? You know, the Bible gives several illustrations of those who sought someone else out to help them and to strengthen them. Andrew went to Peter to bring him to Christ in John chapter 1. Verse number 40. Philip went to the Ethiopian eunuch to give him the gospel in Acts chapter number 8. Jesus said there would be great reward in eternity for those Christians who took the time to minister. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter number 25, verses 31 through 40, to the least of these. It's said that you can impress from a distance, but that you can only impact by being close. The parable of the lost sheep, Christ told how the shepherd loved that one sheep and left the 99 in the fold to pursue the one. A friend is somebody who will seek you out. If you're struggling, you ought to be thankful for somebody that would seek you out. You ever think, I wish they'd stop calling do they have to text every time I miss church? Every time they don't see me, do they have to call me? Maybe they care. Maybe they love you. 
Maybe they want to seek you out. Maybe they want to make sure that you're okay. Maybe they want to be what a friend really is. The problem is that today's world and our modern society isn't familiar with this, with this type of friendship. I believe it's a biblical friendship. We see that Jonathan strengthened David spiritually. In 1 Samuel 23, in verse number 16, it says, In Jonathan, Saul's son arose and went to David into the wood and strengthened his hand, what does it say? In God. You know, it's wonderful to clothe those who don't have anything to wear. To give food to those that are hungry. It's good to encourage people. But how much more important is it to strengthen someone spiritually? To be a real friend? To share what the Scripture says? The Bible says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, and the kisses of an enemy are deceitful above all. We see that he wanted to help David spiritually. We see that he was also, your next blank, is giving in friendship. He was giving in friendship. It's been said that you can't spell love without G-I-V-E. To love someone is to give. To give of ourselves, to give of our time. To give of, of opportunity. Uh, to give of, of our wealth. To be a friend to someone, to love someone, is to be willing to give what you have for them. You know, there's no question that when you love someone, you're willing to give to them. I think we can all see that the world today is becoming increasingly materialistic. To pursue more for ourselves. What are we willing to pursue and do and give for others? You know, as Christians, we shouldn't reflect what the world does. We should reflect what the Word of God says. You know, to be like Christ, our Heavenly Father, we ought to be givers. The most known and most quoted verse in all the Bible, John 3.16, says what? For God so loved that He that He gave. Love is defined by our Heavenly Father is expressed through giving. How many of you have ever seen, read, or heard of the book The Five Love Languages? Anybody? Everybody ever heard of that? That's an interesting philosophy of man. The truth is, I think everyone understands love through giving because that's the way that God expressed His love to us is that He gave whether it's quality time, we're doing what? Giving. Whether it's gifts, we're doing what? Giving. Words of affirmation is really not just words, but it's what? It's giving of, of, our, of our heart and sharing with somebody else. Well, all love is rooted in giving something to somebody else. Can we express to somebody how we feel? Could, we, could you, if you have a spouse, could you aptly describe to them how you feel for them? You can try, but the truth is you really can't. Husbands, this is a good time to put your arm around your wife and say, there's no way I could express possibly the amount of love I have within my very soul and being for you. Okay, some guys, some guys are right there. Some are saying, yeah. <laughs> but isn't it true? Words enough by themselves can't express how we feel for those that we love but to really give sacrificially of whatever it might be. In some ways, help say what we can't put into words. Whether it's time, whether it's materials, whether it's anything, words that we express to somebody that we love. A true friend is somebody that gives. I read this quote, I thought it was pretty good. It said, if Barbie is so popular, why do you have to buy her friends? (laughs) 
Uh, I read, there was, I mean, uh, 2002, an, an article in the Associated Press about a man who would, he was going around one of the malls in Tampa. He was a very wealthy man. He had made all of his money in real estate. And he would go out on Saturdays, on weekends in the mall, and he would, they said, the way it was described, strapped to his body was dollar bills. And he would go around just giving out money. And he said, I get far more from it than they ever could. He said, I don't have any agenda, but I've been blessed, so I want to give from what I have to give to others. If anyone's going to strap on $7,000 and start giving it away, you can start at 771 South Riverside Drive. <laughs> I was... I was talking to Brother Earl at the hospital. He said, uh, he mentioned two people who I won't name, and he said, uh, he said, you know how they started making electrical wire out of copper? I said, no. He named these two individuals. He said, they both got on one end of a penny, and they pulled on it. <laughs> and that's how they started making copper electrical wire. He said they were thrifty. They were tight. You could use the word cheap. There's one area we not ought to be cheap in, and that's giving to those that we love and to our friends. Amen. And of anything that we have. Amen. Hetty Green was an extreme. She was the epitome of cheap. For many years, she was called America's greatest miser. When she died in 1916, she left an estate valued at $100 million in 1916. That fortune today would be comparable to over a billion dollars. In spite of all her vast wealth, uh, Hetty was so cheap that she ate cold oatmeal in order to save the expense of heating the water. When her son had a severe leg injury, she spent so long trying to find a free clinic that when she eventually did, they had to amputate his leg because of the infection. It's been said that Hetty hastened her own death by bringing on a seizure while arguing the merits of skin milk over whole milk based simply on its price. Although Hetty Green's an extreme example, many people have this same type of outlook on life. The lives of some people are cold and sad instead of demonstrating the warmth and, and generosity of God's love to those around them. We see that it was a giving friendship. We see that he gave of his possessions. We read it in, at the very beginning in 1 Samuel chapter 18, in verses 3 and 4. It says, Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David, and his garments, even to his sword, and to his bow, and to his girdle. It says he gave him his bow and his sword. A weapon was very valuable and very personal. And it says that he gave it to his friend. You say, what's the lesson there? I say the lesson is this. If you consider the pastor your friend, you ought to give him any weapons that you have. Okay? <laughs> I don't think that's really the lesson that was there, although it may be an applicable one. It's been aptly said that something is not real until it's personal. Jonathan was willing to give personally in a way that affected him, a way that hurt him, a way that impacted him because he deeply cared for David. There's no question that this sent a message of love and care to David from Jonathan that could not be denied. 
Who was the last person that felt your love for them because you gave? Anybody ever given to somebody else in any capacity and you felt bad after doing it? I tell you, I just shouldn't have done that. I just shouldn't have given. You know what? Really, the one who gets the real joy in giving is who? It's the one that's giving. But yet we're so, we can be so stingy to hold on to whatever, whatever we have, whether it's money, whether it's time, resources, whatever it might be. But he gave of his possessions. He gave of his position. 1 Samuel 23, verse number 17. And he said unto him, Fear not, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find thee, and thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee, and that also Saul my father knoweth. I guess I've always known this, but I never considered it. See, how did he give of him in his position? He said, You'll be king, and I'll be next unto you. What was Jonathan? He was the heir to the throne. He was willing to step aside and to give that position, and his friendship and the giving of the position wasn't based upon the qualifications of David, but was based upon the will of God. He understood that David was God's anointed, and, and as being such, he stepped aside and even given of his own position. Opportunity that many would have said was rightfully his. Matthew 19, verses 28 through 30, what does Jesus say? He tells his disciples that the first will be last and the last will be first. We see this idea carried out in the Old Testament by Jonathan. He gave his promise. 1 Samuel 20, and verse number 4, Then said Jonathan unto David, Whatsoever thy soul desireth, I will even do it for thee. We see that Jonathan's commitment to David wasn't just for the present, but it was a promise for the future. A real friendship isn't just an understanding that you'll stand by someone in their current circumstances, but a real friendship gives the assurity to the other party that no matter what the circumstances will be, you'll be there and be by their side. That's what a real friend is. Friendships today come and go as times get difficult and times get hard. Jonathan gave a promise to David that he'd be by his side no matter what. That's what a real friendship is. Anyone ever heard of Burma shave signs before? Now, we looked at he gave his promise. We're looking at friendship now as a warning. So, in the 1930s and 40s, before there was interstates, there wasn't really roadsides either. So a businessman, uh, he was the owner of a popular shaving cream company, decided to start putting road signs out that were a type of, of warning. Who's heard of Burma shave signs before? So you know they typically came in fives, right? red signs with white letters, and there would be uh, couplets. So there would be the four lines that come from a couplet, and then the last one would say what? Burma shave. It would say Burma shave. Here are some of these signs that were seen even as warnings. Trains don't wander. Then the next sign would say, all over the map, because no one sits in the engineer's lap. One said she kissed the hairbrush by mistake. She thought it was. Her husband Jake. <laughs> Don't lose your head to gain a minute. You need your head. Your brains are in it. <laughs> Drove too long, driver snoozing. What happened next is not amusing. Brother Speeder. Let's rehearse all together. Good morning, nurse. Speed was high, weather was not. Tires were thin. X marks the spot. No matter the price, no matter how new, 
the best safety device in the car is you. A guy who drives a car wide open is not thinking, he's just hoping. At intersections, look each way. A harp sounds nice, but it's hard to play. Both hands on the wheel, eyes on the road. That's the skillful driver's code. The one who drives, when he's been drinking, depends on you to do his thinking. Passing school zone, take it slow. Let our little shavers grow. Warning signs. What are warning signs in, in our life? There's something that says stop. Don't go any further. You know what a good friend is? A warning sign. Someone who'll tell us at times what's hard to hear. Someone who at times help us understand what others won't tell us. One of the most tragic events in world history happened in 1986 in the Soviet Union, the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. There were two electrical engineers who were there. They found themselves with a lot of time on their hands as they observed the nuclear reactors. They devised a, a game where they would turn off one and they would see how long it would free spin and how long they could get it to free spin before they would start it up again. It was said that there were six different alarms that they had to independently turn off to get the turbines to go as slow as they did, causing this great nuclear disaster, the impact of which was felt around the world. the greatest industrial accident the world has ever known. Six times they had to manually turn off the warning sign. Six times they had to ignore the buzzer. Six times they had to put in a passcode. All for their own entertainment and all for what they thought would be a, a good time. ends in nuclear disaster. How many times are we going to turn off a warning buzzer when a friend comes alongside us, when they want to help us? I quoted the text earlier. The scripture says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful above all. What disaster is it going to take what impact is there going to be? Some of the hardest things to hear come from the people that love us the most. Some of the hardest things to hear, that which needs to be heeded the most. Hey, if you're involved in sin, you ought to have a friend who'd come alongside you and say you're doing wrong. If you're responding wrong to a situation, you need a friend who will be a warning sign and say, hey, when that happens next time, you ought not respond that way. You know what you don't need? You don't need a friend that says, I'm done with you. You don't need a friend that says that it's over. You don't need a friend that says, well, you made a mistake and I'm perfect, so I can't be your friend anymore. If that was the case, none of us could be anybody's friend. We need friends who will be that warning sign who will be that godly example. We feel ourselves slipping down sometimes a path of destruction and we so easily ignore the signs that are put in front of us by our friends and those who love us, but just as much as we see and we need those warning signs, we need to be that warning sign of that help in someone else's life. So the destruction that we know that could possibly lie ahead is avoided because someone was willing to say, hey, stop. But yet as a good friend, we need to be willing to look and to heed to the warning signs that are put in front of us. His warning was timely. We see that in 1 Samuel 20. It 
we see that we see that I'm out of town right now. <laughs> Not only was it timely, but it was trusted. It was trusted. Experience from the friendship of David, or of Jonathan, taught David that he could trust his advice. He could heed his, his warnings. I think this could be said tonight. We all ought to thank God for the friends that he's given us. To that, can we say amen? amen? And I'm challenged by this tonight, that I'd be like Jonathan. I'd be a better friend. We, I'm done. My notes are up, my iPad's off, and my Bible's closed. We live in a, we live in a, in a society that quickly... We live in a, a throwaway society. Anybody have an old refrigerator? Old refrigerators, you know what they used to do? Run. Seems like the older they were, the longer they ran. Now you get a refrigerator, and you get a 90-day warranty with it. Uh, a year down the road, the little touchscreen doesn't work anymore. You can't, well, getting the parts out of China is another problem, right? We live in a disposable society. What do we do? We throw it away and we get another one. We don't get it fixed. Marriages have become a, a throwaway society. They don't work, it's hard. We'll just discard it and see if we can't find something better. Hey, can I tell you this? Your problems are going to follow you to somebody else. Amen. Friendships get hard, get difficult. I don't need this. The truth is, you do need it. We all need friends. And real friends, real friends ignore the throwaway society that we, that we live in. Hey, I got news. We're all broken. Right. We're all going to let people down. Let's be thankful for the friends God's given us. And also, let's say, God, help us to be a friend like Jonathan was to David. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I'm